Okay, hi, welcome to Crow Canyon. My name is Paul. I'm an educator here, and uh, we're standing inside of a replica of a 7th century, somewhere between 6 and 700 AD, pit house. And these pit houses were pretty common throughout what we call the Mesa Verde region. Uh, these people were farmers, so these are some of the first really permanent structures we see on the landscape around here. And they're built in a way that's uh, kind of replicated over and over and over again, just the way our houses in their own way are very similar to each other. So I'd like to sort of show you a few things. I want to start with a map because I don't think anyone's ever really seen a whole pit house. What we do is when we excavate them, we are looking at this building's foundation, really. The top of the building is all rotted away. It's been filled in. But over and over and over again, we see a pretty uh, consistent layout. And the best way to describe these, if you want to think about it, is sort of a snowman or a figure eight. But it's got a very large main chamber, and that's probably where most of the living and uh, domestic activities happened. There's a smaller chamber, we call it an antechamber. Ante means before, so um, this uh, layout generally faces towards the south. In the center of the main chamber, there's typically a fireplace. Uh, there's a wall in between the antechamber and the fireplace. We call that a deflector. And then typically there are some walls that fly out from the side, and we call those wing walls. So, I want to show you a model. And this model, first of all, I'm going to turn it on its side so you can see the overall shape. And it's a cutaway. And these would have looked like a low mound on the landscape. So as you were approaching a pit house, it would have looked, in a way, similar to a very large anthill. And the entrance, we believe, was typically through the roof, which is near, uh, placed over the uh, fireplace. And there may have been some kind of vent at the uh, south end, maybe it was in the roof, maybe it was in the side, and I don't think that was a doorway. We think that was more uh, an air shaft. So I'm going to set this aside and give you a little tour of the building. And as you come in, we're looking right here into the main chamber, and the structure is built generally about three feet below ground level. So ground level outside is right about here. And this main chamber, this is a medium size, maybe about 10, 12 feet by 10, 12 feet across, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. The fireplace is here. This is the deflector. And there's an opening in the ceiling just above that. The ladder indicates this is probably the main way in and out and uh, it would have provided a lot of t protection from the elements and um, if you had to really worry about animals or other people. Uh, the main advantage of this building, okay, is that it's very well insulated. And how it's put together are there's four main posts, uprights, and then there are cross beams, and those support all the secondary uh, beams and filler. That filler would have been brush, twigs, branches, and it's covered over by a good four to six inches of mud on the outside. So these were very well insulated. They would have maintained a pretty constant temperature, even in the middle of winter, of maybe... Uh, 45 to 55 degrees and it wouldn't take much from a small fire to heat this up to a comfortable temperature of 60 or more degrees. Um, how this situation works with the fire is 
that, uh, you know, any kind of open fire is going to create a lot of smoke. You'd like to get the smoke out but maintain the heat. So, if ideally the smoke rises, but you have to get fresh air into this building, hence that's why we've got the little opening at the far end, and I don't think it was as big as this door, I think they were much smaller. Cool air would come in, travel, since cool air sinks, travel along the ground, and instead of blowing on the fire, this deflector would be placed in front of the fire pit, allowing that air to circle around rather than blowing on, and hopefully most of the uh, smoke would go up. These buildings are somewhat hard to find in the field because if it's been uh, burnt or it's fallen down and decayed and it's been mm, 1,200 years since they were lived in, there's not much on the ground anymore. So what archaeologists look for is when they do a survey, they walk on the landscape and they look for small pieces of pottery. The kind of pottery that was used at this time is a very plain gray looking pottery. In a lot of ways they look like a gourd. They're rounded on the bottom, small necks. They could have been much larger. Some of them can be hold several gallons. Some of them are small. And another typical pot is something we call a seed jar. It's a small jar. You could easily put a cap on it. You could preserve seeds for the future and probably even cook in these, although to us they don't seem like the ideal shape. So when we're, when we're walking on the landscape, what we're finding are just these small pieces of a very plain gray looking piece of pottery. And that's usually our first indication that somebody's been living in the area. Now, going with this pit house and to the south towards the doorway, outside a few meters, we generally find what we call a midden. That's the trash so area. When they had a fire in here, and there's nothing but ash, they'd have to clean that out, that would go in the midden. If they accidentally broke a pot, that would go in the midden. They wore sandals when those wore out. Those would go in the midden, as long as bones, burnt seeds, anything like that. So the midden is really our first indication that there's a site nearby. And if the midden is approached, we typically know that the house is going to be to the north of that. So then comes the excavation process, and one of the best ways to do things is either you can take a probe, which is a long pipe with a little tube on the end, and you can screw it into the ground and pull out the dirt and look at the core samples, or if you've got a lot of time and money, you actually strip the surface, and you should see an outline, because when one of these falls in, Whatever fills it in will never ever be exactly like the dirt that was there originally. So we would see an outline between the original ground surface and everything that's filled in. So people were living in these from about somewhere between about 5 600 AD to about the mid 700s. After that they start to switch to more uh, surface rooms but this idea of being underground never leaves the Pueblo people. They modify these pit houses, they get deeper, six to eight feet deep, and then over time they are transformed into another underground structure we call a kiva. So what we're looking at, to, to wrap things up here, are the first uh, really uh, visible permanent houses that we see on the landscape. And being farmers, these people were staying in one place. Maybe a, a, a hamlet might have consisted of anywhere from two, three, five, or more pit houses. And they would really only last for about 10, 12 years before, well, wood starts to decay. Maybe the firewood is diminished. Maybe the deer and animals for hunting have diminished. And it seems like about that time people start to move, maybe a couple miles. They start over again. They live there for another 10 or 12 years, and then they move again. And sometimes coming back to where they lived uh, originally. So anyway, that's a brief look at uh, a basket maker pit house. 
Uh, sometimes in our programs we call these people the early farmers, going from about 500 A.D. to about 750 A.D. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed that. Hey, hi, I'm Paul. I'm an educator here at Crow Canyon, and today I'm going to attempt to make a, a fire by friction. There's a number of ways you can do this. If you're really tough, you can use your hands to turn the spindle stick. Um, what we're going to use is a bow drill to uh, turn the stick and see if we can get it from there. So I've got a bow. Uh, some of the equipment, uh, this is called a hearth board. This is the spindle stick. I've got a little piece of leather to catch the ember if we get it going, and a capstone to keep my hand protected uh, so I don't get a big blister. But anyway, the first thing I want to do is create a nest, which is our kindling. I've made that out of cedar bark. I simply took it, wrapped it into a little nest shape, set that off to the side, and put some really fine material in it. I'm going to place the Hearth board on the leather pad. And then I want to find just the right position for this. I want you to notice that I'm kneeling. You can't really do this properly just sitting down. I want to put all my weight on the hearth board. And then I want to wrap the bow one loop around the spindle stick. So now I'm going to place the spindle stick in a hole on the hearth board, put the capstone in place, and first I've got to get it seated in here, so I'm going to go slow. Put a little pressure. Now I've got a tiny ember that I'm going to place into the nest. Let's see if I can ignite this. I don't want to blow too hard. See that the ember's in there. And we've got a little flame. And that's that. Now maybe a little bit more air. Okay, Let's see if you can do that at home. Hi guys, so we're going to talk a little bit about throwing with the atlatl. This is an atlatl um, and it is used as a tool for hunting. It's a weapon. Um, people throughout the world have and continue to use the atlatl for hunting. Um, in fact, the atlatl is used on every continent except Africa and Antarctica. So we're actually going to show you how to throw with this today. 
and there's a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, you can hold it a couple different ways that I'll show you. One is you can use your pointer finger and your thumb, stick them through the loops here and wrap the rest of your fingers around the atlatl itself. The other way is to use your pointer finger and your middle finger and wrap the rest of your fingers around the atlatl as well. So what you throw with an atlatl is a dart, which I have right here. And you would take the atlatl with your fingers through the loops like we talked about, your fingers wrapped around the atlatl itself, and you're gonna bring the spur, which is this little protrusion here, to the back of your dart. So with the dart, you'll see that our dart has a stub on it so that it doesn't hurt people. But normally there would be a projectile point at the end of it um, so that when you throw it, it would stick into the animal, obviously. Okay, so let's get back to this. I use my pointer finger and my thumb. It's the easiest way to hold it if you have short fingers. This way is a little bit uh, more difficult for me anyway. Some people prefer it. So thumb, point your finger, the rest around the atlatl. Bring the end of your atlatl to your dart. Okay? Then you're going to bring it all the way back so you get as much movement as you can or most range of motion as you can. And I step forward with my left foot and throw. And I missed the character to put that <laughs> right. So one thing I will note, um, I am left-handed. I know the majority of people are right-handed. So if you're right-handed, same thing, point your finger, thumb, fingers around, you're gonna step back and throw. Um, the only difference is I'm left-handed. Hi, today I'm gonna talk about making cordage. So we know that prehistorically, historically, people have been making string for everything. Everything that you need, bows, arrows, uh, anything that you're going to tie with to tie your structure. Uh, we find it archaeologically, we find them in rooms, we, we find cordage in a lot of different places. Uh, you can use yucca. Yucca is a great uh, plant to use for making cordage, uh, sinew from any animal that you can you can make string out of. There are a few things that you can make string out of today. I got this nice long string that I'm going to use um, and uh, we'll make some cordage out of this. So here is their cordage here and what we're going to do, it's pretty long and what you need to do is just make two pieces of cordage. So I got this nice long string. I'm going to fold it in half. I'm going to tie a little knot to it. So I'm tying a knot, put it together. So now I have two loose ends. Okay, and then I'm going to hold the knot with my left hand. Even though if you're left-handed, they're still going to, I'm doing it right-handed. Okay, so I'm holding a knot with my left hand. With my right hand, I'm going to twist the string to the right. So in your right, twist it to the right. So twist it to the right, and then I'm going to go under and grab the other string and bring that one I just did twisted to the left. So now I have the newer the other string I haven't twisted yet, so I'm going to twist that string to the right. Everything's always to the right. Twist it to the right and then bring it over the top to your left hand and switch your string. Okay, you're gonna do the same thing. It's the same motion over and over again. I'm staying really high because if I go way down here, I have to twist a lot of the string, but by keeping it really short, I can twist a lot. You wanna twist it. The more you twist it, the tighter your cordage is going to be. It's always the same motion over and over again. And notice how I'm just moving my hand down as I go. So 
So, and if I wanted to make my string longer, once I got down to here, I could just add in another string and twist that. And they found all the twine in the archaeological record, and it was a quarter of a mile long. So you make the string really, really long, because if you were making the turkey feather blanket or anything else, you would need string that's really, really 